welcome to this seminar, this ASIC seminar. I'm Marco Bezzi, I'm part of the UNESCO Chair for Human and Sustainable Development. And uh, the topic today is about uh, water management at local scale. And uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, in this uh, seminar Giulio Castelli and maybe Nambi that they will speak about their experience and expertise in this field. And I already thank you very much to them to, to share with us their expertise and their experience in the field. This is a part of an ASIC seminar series, Environmental Sustainability and International Cooperation Seminars. In the previous uh, seminar, we spoke about different topics, uh, green energy, wash, uh, mapping emergency, agriculture, water energy food nexus, uh, and the water resource management at global scale. So today we will speak uh, more deeply on uh, water management at local scale. But before to start uh, the seminar, I would like to su submit you an uh, instant pool. So uh, Livia will share in the chat uh, a link uh, and uh, you will, uh, uh, if you want, try to uh, answer to some question that are really related with the topic uh, that uh, will be presented later in the seminar. So I think that uh, the, the link is already in the chat, Livia. Okay, yes. so you can have a look at the chat. And uh, while you are answering, uh, it's a pleasure to, to introduce uh, uh, the first speaker, Giulio Castelli, is a uh, graduated in environmental engineering uh, and he has a PhD in sustainable management uh, in agricultural forestry and food resources. Giulio uh, has experience uh, with uh, AICS, Italian Agency for Development Cooperation, and also has experience as consultant for the World Bank and uh, currently is uh, a research fellow at the University of Florence. His uh, experience uh, is uh, related with uh, uh, water harvesting, uh, management of water resources, uh, with particular attention to arid areas, uh, hydrological and agrohydrological modeling, and the participatory research methods. So it's a pleasure, uh, Giulio, to give you the floor. Um, after the Giulio Castelli talk, uh, we will proceed uh, uh, with the second talk of uh, maybe Nambi, and then we will have uh, we will have time for a final discussion about the two uh, talks that we will have today. So welcome, Giulio, and I give you the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Marco, for the introduction. And thank also to Professor Zortea and Professor Zorezzi and all the, the young uh, co colleagues of the UNESCO Chair of Trento. So I'm just uh, opening my presentation now. Okay, and we can start. So, um, my presentation, my webinar will be about water harvesting uh, for uh, management of green and blue water, but also for rural development. And um, I will give you like uh, a brief uh, rationale about uh, the importance of, of this kind of, of technologies for water management. And I will try also to develop a red line along, uh, I mean, the current state of practice and our uh, research as the University of Florence in, in this framework. So I, I think it was nice to, to give a little bit the bigger picture. Um, so you, I think you all know that uh, we are in a critical situation for meeting uh, the, the world uh, demand for food. And according to, to some scholars, this might need uh, a, doubling, a doubling of the global food production, which I think is not entirely true because we have uh, a lot of food waste also, but these are the figures. And to do so, uh, water is a limiting factor. So what, what do we need is, is a radical rethink of the global water management strategies and policies. 
Um, but if you see the thing by the other way around, so by, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals Framework, um, you see that there is a kind of a bias. So water is explicitly uh, addressing goal six, uh, which is uh, clean water and sanitation for all, but there is uh, quite uh, little mention of, of the water, of the need of water required uh, for food production and alleviate hunger, which is goal number two. So there is not a clear link about water as a um, limiting factor for food production, even though SDGs talks about water and about food production. And you can see that there is a bias also if you see the colors. So you see that the, the SDG 6 uh, logo is essentially light blue. And, and this indicates that at the global policy level, there is still a bias, uh, which is a focus on the blue water. So you know, I think you know what, what is uh, blue water. So blue water is, is the water that is uh, considered uh, as uh, flowing water, fresh water, and groundwater, um, meaning the water in freshwater lakes, rivers, and aquifers. But uh, in, if you think about um, the reason why uh, blue water is, is the leading water in, in, in this kind of policy, uh, you could read it through like perspective. So this blue water bias, so pushing a lot uh, infrastructure and water management policies targeting the management of, of the water as fresh water, basically starts in the 50s when you had a lot of global efforts in building new infrastructures focusing on, on this kind of management. But uh, if you see what is really done in the field, uh, you will see that a lot of uh, ecosystems, but also a lot of uh, farming systems and, and, and the practically the, the majority of food production that is um, developed in, in, uh, in small scale farming areas, which, which are the majority, are based on green water. So green water is the water that uh, is falling on the land and which does not immediately run off for research and aquifer, but that is stored for the soil temporarily and stays on the top of the soil or of the vegetation, and that can be immediately used for uh, crop production. So this, this green water has probably the largest share of responsibility for the global food production. And as water management, uh, people, and especially if you see through the lenses of agricultural water management, that's the most important kind of water for food production. And you see here, for, for some relevant papers, maybe if, if someone of, of you works uh, with more water management, probably, you know, with Marine Falkenmark that created the Falkenmark indexes. And, and you see here at the global scale, how much of uh, food production relies mainly on green water and, and how much it relies on, on blue water. So you have basically only the areas which have very large irrigation system like India, um, some parts of, of the Arabic Peninsula and uh, the uh, Western United States that rely, rely mostly on blue water. The rest of the world is relying on green water. And, and you see that also the, the hotspots for uh, unnourished people and population growth are the areas where green water is most, most important for food production. So the, the idea is why you should focus on uh, blue water management when you have such strong importance and relevance of green water for food, food production. And here we come to the topic of today that is water harvesting, that is also the topic of research that we have in our group at the University of Florence. So water harvesting is the process of concentrating precipitation through runoff and storing it for a beneficial use. You can use it for uh, 
potable, uh, um, drink, potable and drinking purposes. You can use it for agriculture and you can use water harvesting for environment and landscape use. And basically the, the idea um, underpinning water harvesting is that uh, instead of uh, um, using directly blue water from perennial rivers or lakes, uh, or even groundwater, you take the maximum advantage of quick, rapid flows generated by rainfall, where the rainfall uh, fo falls. And, and this has a particular importance, especially for all the agroecosystems where hydrology is not perennial. So think about uh, large part of Africa, but also Asia. You don't have a perennial hydrology, so the, the current paradigm about uh, uh, blue water management for, for development is, is actually useless. You have to learn how to use better green water, how to store green water in the soil, and definitely how to do water harvesting. Mm, the first definition that, that I gave, uh, the process uh, of uh, concentrating precipitation through and off, et cetera, is, is quite an old but yet good definition. Uh, but uh, I also like the second one uh, made by a colleague, the uh, name is Mohamed Wassari, is Tunisian, uh, which identifies water harvesting as a collective term for a wide, a wide variety of low cost intervention, uh, which are uh, intended to collect natural water resources, which otherwise would have escaped from the human reach, and buffer them through storage and or recharge on or below the soil surface. So this means that when you do water harvesting, what you do is, is you take advantage of what are called uh, uh, natural water resources that would have escaped from human reach. So that that would be water that actually you would not consider if you see the thing under the blue water lenses. But it becomes very important if you consider it as green water. And you see that uh, definitely the, the effect is not only at the crop or at the field scale, but also is an increased retention of water in the landscape, enabling uh, the use of water for multiple purposes. And here we have some examples around the world. So th these are called uh, micro catchment uh, uh, water harvesting uh, systems. Uh, you see that we, we have the so-called half moons, but we could have also stone lines in Niger. We can have a roof, rooftop water harvesting system. Th these were systems that we made ourselves for collecting uh, rainwater for uh, um, basically a uh, small scale crop production with uh, tanks made by uh, ram and dirt bricks. You might have also cross slope measures like terracing to slow down runoff and increase infiltration uh, also with uh, trenches. But you can also take advantage of more uh, unexpected and even more violent uh, events like uh, the so-called flood-based farming, which is uh, basically carried out where uh, you, you have very, very dry hydrology with only few rainfall, which are very intense. So you have uh, ephemeral uh, rivers that have uh, sudden flood, floods. And, and basically, especially in the lowlands, this is the only water that you get, and you get it in 20 days, and then the rest of the year is dry. So you, that, that, that is really a lot of engineering be, behind these technologies. But on the other side, you can also understand that they are basically also traditional and embodied in current water routines and, and people has, has a lot of knowledge about those. So if you look at the thing under a very ideological perspective, you can understand uh, which is the role of water harvesting in this graph. So um, there are many studies that uh, reveals how for farmers, uh, it is more dangerous to have a dry spell. So a period of um, drought that lasts, uh, I mean, from 10 to 15 days, that a prolonged drought. And, and this is because if you are a farmer and, and you see that in, in one season, you have a very long and severe drought, you do not start preparing your field. You do not buy agricultural inputs. 
maybe I mean you go and and you work uh, uh, off a farm. You start working in another maybe building company, and so on and so on for that year. But uh, the point is that uh, if you are a farmer and if you start uh, cultivating, because in in the onset of the rainy season you you have a lot of water, you have rainfall. And then you buy a lot of agricultural inputs. And then maybe in the 10 days or 15 days in which you have the flowering of your crops, you have a dry spell, so you don't have rain and you don't have also irrigation water. You lost completely your crops. And this means that you lost all, all your work and, and you lost also all the costs of the agricultural inputs that you put in your field. So this is the, the main role of water harvesting and the reason why it is so important because it helps even if it's not a proper and a large scale irrigation facility, it helps farmers to have water in the soil or maybe in a tank during dry spells. And basically a water harvesting system is defined by a catchment area. Uh, in, in the catchment you had rainfall, the rainfall is transformed into run runoff and, and the runoff is collected in a storage, which can be the soil itself. And then everything is, is uh, applied to the cultivated area. And you see also how it works at like a meteorological balance level. So if you have water harvesting, uh, you basically decrease the soil evaporation and quick runoff and you increase infiltration subsurface flows, ground flows, and evapotranspiration for food and vegetation. So just some quick slides to show another uh, very important thing. So water harvesting is meaning to uh, support more water. And, and you are a lot of research that shows also an additional factor. Um, so, especially in dry areas with, where you don't have water, but, but also the soil is very poor in fertility, the real increase in, in crop yield is made by applying uh, water harvesting, so an extra water input and, and soil fertility. So you, you can see it by multiple experiments. This is uh, with uh, a reaper that has also a function of water harvesting at a local scale. And, and here you see some practices that, that, that are made, I think these are from Niger, so you can really maximize the effect of water harvesting also if you use some manure or some uh, crop residuals. The, the meaning of, of this is to show that uh, at, at the level of uh, landscape restoration, you can trigger this kind of dynamics. So basically uh, we, with the water harvesting, uh, you, can, you can increase uh, crop production because you have more water and uh, with, with crop production you can have also uh, vegetation uh, crop growth that increase the soil fertility but also you have uh, vegetation residuals to do mulching to do uh, manure etc and and maybe i mean you are engineer i i learned this by my colleague in soil science uh, if if you have more uh, biodiversity diversity, more organic matter in the soil, then the structure of the soil becomes better and, and it, it stores more water. So the effect of water harvesting in the soil is increased. So, so you, you basically, if you apply uh, well this paradigm of water harvesting and, and soil fertility management, you can trigger a cycle. I'm just closing uh, with some uh, research experiences that we made in last years uh, that, that uh, one by one highlight uh, other uh, different uh, like uh, topics related to water harvesting. This, this was the first research that we made around 2014 in Ethiopia, uh, where uh, we basically highlighted that the local farmers, uh, they have a great knowledge about water harvesting, in this case was a flood water harvesting. And um, basically we managed to obtain a better design for the water harvesting structures and irrigation structures by involving farmers in the design with a participatory approach. This is to uh, mention that uh, 
Water harvesting is effective under a management point of view because Doha communities are already experts. While if you go with uh, an approach that is targeting uh, modernization of irrigation uh, with uh, like northern uh, or maybe uh, first world approach, it is likely to fail. This was another uh, research that we made uh, in Ethiopia with, with a PhD student uh, now in the University of Florence. Uh, that, that shows how these kind of dams, which are called sand dams, that are still water harvesting, you see that they store sand, but then the water infiltrates in the sand, so you have like an artificial aquifer. So with this research uh, on, on the field, we demonstrate that uh, this kind of uh, water harvesting technology can help uh, farmers in increase uh, crop yields but we made also some modeling that revealed the thing that we said before. So you cannot get the, the max, maximum water productivity if you only work on water, you need fertilizers and soil fertility management. This was another research that was made more recently for my PhD, where it was shown that actually the overall effect of water harvesting at, at the landscape scale can also, um, I mean, trigger like a cooling effect in an arid watershed. So you have more water in the soil and during the dry season, you have an evapotranspiration effect that, that makes a overall cooling effect in the watershed. And, and this is our last research. It might be interesting. We basically make a global map of the potential for water harvesting. What we did is, is uh, I'm, I'm going very short, you can read the publication if you are interested, but we try to upscale a database of a successful case study to obtain a global map of, of water harvesting potential. And, and, and you see that there is much potential, especially in, in Eastern Africa, but also in Asia, there is a lot of potential. So as conclusions, uh, I mean, I, I think it is undeniable that uh, at least at the very, very top level uh, global policy scale, green water management, which is important, is still a little bit underrated. And, and I think we could really work in this sense uh, to better structure uh, a global action on green water management, especially for dry areas and, and for the developing countries, but also for the countries that have problems of uh, food production. Water harvesting can represent a sustainable solution uh, for reaching this goal, um, also for ecosystem restoration, and it's basically a local water management action. But you, you do, do not forget that it, it is not only the only, it is not only the, the sole way to make green water management. You have other, other green water management strategies. For instance, uh, mulching is another strategy that you can use. The, there is a wide body of literature in this sense. It is not still uptaken at the, the global level. And third point, water harvesting is a good water management uh, technique because it's quite in line with the local knowledge and routines. And as a fourth point, of course, that is not a panacea. There are some research points open. Um, the first one is, is really evaluate the, the condition under which water harvesting is economically uh, profitable for farmers, because that's when farmers adopt this technology. They won't adopt it if it's nice and it works good. They adopt it if, if it's uh, working under an, an economic point of view. There are also some barriers uh, uh, for the analysis of, and, and the implementation of water harvesting, also policies barriers and knowledge barriers. So there is a need of more training for the farmers, but also for the uh, international institutions and local authorities. Um, another point is to in, how to insert uh, water harvesting in like the, I don't know, national scale or regional uh, scale water management uh, policies. This is not quite clear. You know that uh, if a farmer apply water harvesting in his field, uh, that's fine, but how to get the maximum of, of, from these technologies if you uh, reason by, uh, I don't know, river basin uh, scale uh, water management. And, and the final um, hotspot of research to me is how you can bring this technology to 
to the future because they, they are mainly um, traditional uh, water management technologies. So there is a need to modernize that and, and to also make them, uh, let's say, competitive with, with the standard uh, uh, like um, approach for uh, blue water management. So I hope it won't get too long. Uh, I'm available for question after uh, the other presentation. And if you want to keep in touch, these are uh, our contacts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giulio, for your presentation. Very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, to, to have information about this overview, about uh, water harvesting, uh, the importance of green water, and also the importance uh, to combine uh, the water and uh, uh, management with the, the proper soil management. Uh, I think that your presentation will be shared later. Uh, so if you want uh, to have uh, the address of Giulio or information, you can get the presentation. So we can uh, move now to the second talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to invite uh, maybe Nambi, this is a director for uh, WASH, Water Sanitation, excuse me, Water Sanitation and Hygiene Program. Uh, the NGO is World Vision, Zambia. Uh, he has uh, more than 16 years of experience uh, in uh, the wash sector and is a uh, manager of big uh, um, project uh, in uh, different countries and uh, he has experienced different countries in Africa for the wash sector. Um, Mebin uh, has a um, certificate in international wash uh, um, from the University of Nevada and is a uh, Bachelor of Science in uh, Irrigation Engineering uh, from uh, the University of Malawi. So I leave the floor to Mabin, um, and uh, then we have uh, the discussion about the two talks. Thank you very much, Mabin. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'll be presenting on the uh, wash implementation uh, for World Vision uh, here in Zambia. So to just give you a perspective, um, that is the map of Zambia on your left. And 40% uh, and, and of the population currently do not have access uh, to clean water. That is 7 million of the people. And half of the people do not have um, uh, toilets or practice what we call Open uh, defecation, uh, uh, open defecation, and one of the studies that was done uh, in 2014, uh, according to the Zambia Household Demographic Survey, uh, it it was observed that 23% of children under the age of five were um, uh, experiencing issues around uh, diarrhea. And also, uh, one of the things that you need to note is that World Vision uh, for the past 10 years uh, has been able to, uh, uh, to drill around uh, 4,957 4, boreholes uh, across the country. Uh, and also, World Vision has been able to put up around 200 piped water systems, and these are using both renewable energy, uh, like 90% are using renewable energy, and 10% on the uh, on the grid. And all these uh, systems and also the boreholes are benefiting around 1.9 million uh, people uh, currently. Uh, World Vision has been also been able to construct uh, what we are calling uh, small, small dams and weirs uh, for small scale farmers for, uh, for irrigation. Uh, and, and one of the recent studies that, were, that was conducted showed that um, uh, the, the cases of diarrhea has moved from 23% to 13% in, in most of the World Vision Operation area. Uh, as a result of the efforts in terms of uh, uh, the water uh, sanitation and hygiene program, which has been um, implemented. So this is the theory of change in terms of what World Vision would want to achieve. So at, ob at, at objective level, we would want to see children protected from infectious diseases. And we are talking about under five diarrheal diseases, which are prevailing in most of the African countries. 
And, uh, uh, and to achieve this, we are looking at uh, uh, three, uh, four objectives. And uh, uh, the first one is access, universal access to safe and clean water. Uh, the second one is uh, access to basic sanitation facilities. Uh, the third one is uh, looking at hand washing and also menstrual hygiene management. And then the fourth one uh, dwells much more on issues around uh, sustainability of the wash infrastructure, which we are trying to, to construct. And then we have some uh, low level um, uh, outcomes, which we, we, we would want to, to see. Uh, and that is issues around access to basic drinking water uh, in community schools and healthcare facilities. Uh, we're looking at household uh, having the capacity uh, to treat water and also issues around storage. We are looking at issues around sanitation, uh, open defecation free in the, in the communities, solid waste management, uh, issues around menstrual hygiene and hand washing, and also for the communities to have the capacity to be able to, to repair and sustain some of the wash infrastructure which are being uh, constructed. So we, uh, this year we also uh, did uh, one of the uh, a mapping exercise using the MWater tool. So the MWater tool is an open source tool that can be used by, I think, which is being used by quite a number of uh, non-governmental organizations uh, to map the functionality of most of this water uh, infrastructure. So this year, uh, from February up to April, we undertook this particular exercise where we were able to map um, around 9,964 water points uh, across all World Vision operation areas. And also uh, we mapped around 631 water points in schools and also 195 water points uh, in healthcare facilities. You can see uh, the pie charts that we have. So the first one, um, uh, which is uh, looking at water points installed by other organizations. So World Vision, uh, in those particular areas, we were at 46% of the 9, 000, uh, close to 10,000 water points were installed by World Vision and 30% uh, by other organization and government has only been able to invest around 16% of that. And when we look at issues around functionality of these water points, uh, we found that 81% of the surveyed water points were functional, and then about 6.6% .6 were uh, partially functioning. Probably they had small uh, issues around the moving parts, and then 12% had issues uh, were not uh, functioning at all. And then when we, we look at uh, issues around the, the type of, of water point uh, in terms of uh, 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 lifting devices, uh, 43% uh, were, were hand pumps. Uh, so these are boreholes or hand pumps. And then 33% uh, these were like uh, piped uh, water uh, to, to, to the yard and around 13% uh, from unprotected uh, surface water and probably uh, the spring. And then when it comes to the lifting devices, uh, 40, 43%, uh, these were uh, Indian Mark II uh, hand pumps, and then um, the 3.7%, it was uh, submissive pumps. So these are the ones that I talked about, which we're using the, the uh, renewable energy and also the electricity grid. And in terms of management of these water systems, uh, it was uh, found that um, 42% were managed by the local communities. So these are communities. And then um, uh, around 37% was just household. So meaning that each household has got its own, its own tap. And then uh, about 9.6 by just community, community members. So from the M Water 2, when you look at uh, from the, the map on your, on your left, um, uh, we're able to see the, the locations of where World Vision has been able to operate. And on your far right, these are the, some of the, the water points which have been mapped in the M water, uh, the 9,000 
900 uh, water points which we've been able to to drill and also to map out in the in the in the system for monitoring its functionality and also management. So basically, this is what we are doing as a world vision. So I want to thank you so much. Thank you very thank much, you maybe. Much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much, Marco. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a great work that you are doing with um, what uh, World Vision in Zambia, and uh, it will be a pleasure to 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 give our small contribute this uh, summer in September with the University of Trenton with our student. Uh, I think that we can uh, have uh, a discussion about, about uh, the two talks. So, if there is uh, any question from your side, please. Uh, Julian, maybe not able to answer you. I don't know if Nicola finished uh, the presentation with the results of uh, the instant pool. Yes. And so as we can break the ice uh, showing the results. Yes, yes. And sure. improve the discussion. OK. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you. They were really interesting uh, intervention. Um, yes, uh, let me present. Um, okay. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Hope we will not have problems. Okay. So just have a quick look to the answers of the questions. So the first question was about uh, natural based solutions. Um, the question was, select the three main function provided by natural based solution for water management. And uh, this was kind of a tough question. I, I uh, didn't get all the correct answer for sure. <laughs> but um, yes, so um, from the WWDR, uh, uh, nature based solution for water, uh, Nature-based solutions are defined as inspired and supported by nature and use or mimic natural processes to contribute to the improved um, management of water. And um, the, the correct answer were uh, at least uh, the main, uh, the, the one considered the main uh, uh, solution for water management were improving water availability, improving water quality, and reducing risk to water-related extreme events. Um, then uh, the second question was concerning different uh, types of, of uh, irrigation and watering. Um, so the question was, what is the efficiency of surface irrigation, sprinkler irrigation, and drip irrigation? Uh, choose the answer with the correct percentages. Um, of course, yes, this really depends, but uh, the FAO um, uh, let's say, uh, indicates some values uh, at the field application efficiency, uh, as we see in the, in the table. And the correct answer, as nearly most of you answered, but no, uh, the 31% of you cor correctly answered, are 60% uh, surface irrigation, 75% spring, uh, sprinkler irrigation, and 90% drip irrigation. So what we may assume is uh, that maybe um, uh, some effort in order to obtain more efficiency in uh, more efficiency uh, watering uh, solution may uh, may for sure help uh, to fight uh, climate change and problem uh, in water. Uh, the last question uh, is concerning uh, rainwater harvesting, uh, the topic Julio talked about. And, um, so uh, what statement, uh, the question was, what statement about rainwater harvesting is not true? Uh, the first one is uh, it reduced the demand and consumption of groundwater. And this is actually may, may be true if the groundwater is used. Um, it provides an alternative water source in the dry season, reduced the vulnerability of agriculture and population to climate change. And this is as well a, a, a solution. And 
uh, introduce flooding, uh, sewer overflowing, and soil erosion by reducing runoff. The first three were the correct one. Uh, the less correct uh, was it improves the recharge of aquifers and reduce the salinity of the water. Th this time, I guess the, the question were quite hard <laughs> compared to, to the other times. Um, I hope uh, this may be a input for the discussion and thank you. Thank you, Nicola. I have first question for Giulio. Um, what is your experience uh, uh, in the correlation between uh, water harvesting and water distribution? I, in my experience, uh, I, I've seen uh, some uh, uh, very expensive project in water harvesting, but then a uh, big lack in water distribution after the ponds. And uh, also lack on uh, proper community man management of that water. So what's your experience uh, about that? Um, well, I think I can frame the answer or well, at least the discussion in, in two levels. So the, the first level is quite uh, practical. And um, I think I was involved mainly in, in projects uh, where uh, the water harvesting technology was already there. So if you talk about the spate irrigation, uh, which is uh, flood water harvesting techniques, um, all the projects that, that are targeting spate irrigation, they, they are targeting systems which are already existed. So the, the water management rules are clear, they are accepted, they are established since, uh, I would say, decades. Uh, and once the engineering part it works, uh, there is nothing to to discuss about the distribution, if you modernize the system according to the traditional regulation. So if you make a modernization which is respectful of, of the previous uh, agreements, uh, you don't have any problem. And, and this is the same th thing that, that you see, for instance, I did not show it, but we, we had some experience with colleagues from Tunisia. It is exactly the same thing. Um, so, I mean, um, I would say that that uh, you have this first uh, block of, of experiences where that, that's when you, you really start from a technology that is already there. You just, uh, if you are aware of, of, of the water management regulation and you keep them in place, you don't have any issues. You have, you have also some... Uh, um, some example of, of situation where uh, there was a modernization project, uh, the modernization project failed and the farmers, they, they use parts of the modernized system to still, uh, I mean, have a better water management because they have the internal regulation. Uh, if you start with something which is brand new, it's a little bit more difficult, uh, but I, th I think it's the same story uh, th that is around the water management in general. So, like you know that that if you work with water, a water decision is also a land decision. So, generally speaking, uh, if you work with water, you have to take into account, uh, for instance, uh, water management uh, practices rules and also things like land tenure and, and where it's appropriate uh, water uh, um, water property. So you, you don't do a water harvesting uh, dam or a pond in a private uh, uh, area. Or if you do in a private area, you acknowledge that there should be an issue. So uh, ba basically, yes, I, I don't have direct experience of this, but, but this if you study a little bit uh, um, the implementation of, of water management at the local scale with farmers, that, that's a, a common uh, bias of some projects uh, in which you take you, you go with the technology, but you don't take into account, and then the managers are the farmers themselves. So if if you don't take into account the land tenure, for instance, you will have problems. I agree. Thank you, Julio.
If there is any question, again for Giulio, maybe. Well, I have one remark on the on the instant poll for the water harvesting for managing uh, manage aquifer recharge. Uh, that's not entirely true. You have some experiences of, of manage aquifer recharge, um, especially for instance, it's, it, it's becoming quite common with uh, flood water harvesting to deviate uh, flood water in, in some uh, retention basin where, where you have a kind of infiltration pit. So you, you start having some experiences. Uh, Israel uh, is kind of pioneer in this, and you have, you have some experience in Tunisia, and, 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 and also I think in Australia they're starting to do something, but it's, it's not, uh, uh, also in Italy, there are some examples made uh, in Tuscany. Uh, Santana University is, uh, is a leader that, that they are uh, upgrading uh, like um, small water reservoirs in like in the hilly area, which is more or less water harvesting, at least it is water harvesting in Italy. And, and they are making a modernization of them with, with some uh, infiltration device. So it's, it's a little bit complicated because the, the, the regulation in Italy for manage aquifer charges is quite demanding, but, but, but you have this kind of experiences. Uh, nice to learn. It was my bad. <laughs> I have a question for... Oh, please go ahead. Go ahead, Massimo. We'll do the question later. Sorry, Guido. Meanwhile, I would like to put a question to both of the speakers about the connection among uh, universities and research institutions and uh, uh, international NGOs such as uh, uh, World Vision with uh, great budgets and great uh, staffs but many times without uh, great uh, expertise in specific questions uh, or specific issues better uh, such as uh, the wash and the, um, the water management, water resources management. So how to create a, a permanent, a stable uh, linkage among universities and research institutions and NGO and civil society organizations, especially at the local level, like in Zambia? This is my question. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Massimo. Yeah, like, like for, for what vision, um, what we've been able to do is to uh, have a different uh, memorandum of understanding with the university. And, and in that memorandum of understanding, we've been able to take up quite a number of students who've been researching on the works that we are we are doing, so uh, the the research mainly borders around the uh, formative uh, kind of research uh, to kind of inform us in terms of the it could be the technology that we are we are we are we are using in the field. Uh, so this could be the pumps, the solar panels. Um, uh, it could be the drilling. Um, uh, um, methodologies that we are using in different locations as, and also as well as in different uh, terrains uh, and how we can try to maximize our resources in those particular technologies the option that we, we, are, we are able to take to take up and, and and also i think this has worked very well in in, in terms in, in terms of uh, uh, students being able to direct us in terms of how we can try to improve, uh, for example, in our, in our wash programming. Uh, we've done, for example, water for productive use. How can we maximize the same water which we are using, for example, we are, we are, we are providing to the communities for domestic, domestic use, but also for other uses, uh, uh, livestock, for example, 
uh, how can livestock access water for drinking? Because part of the country, like half of the country, we, uh, we don't receive quite enough rainfall. Uh, we could be getting around maybe 600 millimeters uh, per year. And then on the other side, we are getting over uh, a thousand of millimeter of that. So how can we try to maximize the use of, for example, groundwater resource or even small scale uh, rainwater harvesting like we as and the like. So we've, we've had a chance to have some of these students uh, researching on some of these issues. And in some cases, we've had issues around um, uh, 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 ion, for example, in, in groundwater. And, and this has been a big problem because when we started our wash program, we were using what we are calling galvanized iron pipes, which were corroding with uh, raw pH waters. And that created a lot of problems because boreholes were being abandoned like in, in less than a year, and then they are abandoned by the communities. And then you can look at how much investment that has been put into that. At first, we thought this iron was as a result of groundwater, um, uh, being just, you know, uh, by nature like that, because it occurs sometimes. But after the research by the students, they were able to inform us that no, the technology that we are using is wrong. Why can't you change to stainless steel pipes, for example, which cannot, which do not corrode uh, with the aggressive uh, uh, waters like raw pH waters? So that I think has created a kind of uh, a good relationship with the universities and also research institutions, not just local but also international. Like we have the partnership with the Drexel University. Uh, in the U.S., uh, University of North Carolina, Stanford University, um, uh, University of uh, Malawi, University of Zambia. Uh, and, and these have enriched our WASH program to be where we are. Uh, you could see from the graph that I showed you the functionality of the water points at 81% out of the 10,000 that we've been able to put. So that's quite a good uh, uh, report to see because previously, that was very low. You would find that probably only 40% of those boreholes are functional. And you can imagine the investment which the donors are being able to put for us to be able to do all that. So universities, they play a very key role to us in terms of our development work from the NGO perspective. And we are very much uh, are willing to continue to partner with a number of research institutions to better our work. Thank you so much. And also, the question was put uh, to Julia, of course. Um, can, can you just repeat the question with the flame to water harvesting? No, uh, simply uh, considering uh, the institution you are belonging, uh, what are the linkages uh, we can build up in a, a more stable way and institutionalizing the relationship among universities in terms of a third mission and NGOs and civil society organization, providing human resources, knowledge uh, and the, the spirit of the cooperation, not only in project approach, but uh, more in a more long term perspective. This is the question. So, um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I mean, I, th I think it, it would be the other way around for me because I'm, I'm basically in academia. Um, and, and I mean, as, as University of Florence, uh, we, we kind of have a long story in, in this point because uh, Florence, uh, I mean, especially for agriculture, uh, was the headquarters uh, first of the Italian Colonial Agricultural Institute since the 20s. And then this relationship has always been strong uh, um, with, with the University of Florence and, and in the years also with, with uh, a radical change in the mindset, but in a radical change with, with the people involved. Uh, um, we, we were uh, very much linked with uh, the agronomic Overseas Institute of Florence, and then with, with the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation. Um, and, and, and this is to say that uh, uh, luckily for the moment we have in place, in, at least in our Department of Agriculture, uh, 
um, some long-term cooperations. And uh, personally, um, uh, I think that uh, the, the, the best thing that it can be done uh, for a university, uh, I'm sorry to say this, but it's not totally work with NGO. Uh, because, uh, um, I mean, for instance, we, we have a Master of Science in Tropical Rural Development, which, which is a standard Master of Science, and we host many students uh, also from grants from other countries. Um, and, and, and this links us to many NGOs that, that uh, gets our students for traineeship and, and also after the master. But, but to my uh, small experience so far, uh, this is only one part of the thing that you can do. But, but, but then in, in a framework of very horizontal cooperation, I would say that we are a university and, and, and we, don't, we do not do development. So we do learning, research, and education. And, and on the other side, uh, we have universities that do exactly the same thing. So I, I, I know uh, maybe in, he told us he graduated from the University of Malawi. So for instance, we have contacts with the University of Malawi. And, and, and we are basically. I, I am a co-supervisor of a PhD of the University of Malawi. And, and I think this is not development, it's just uh, like uh, sharing ideas and making good science together. And it's, it's the same thing that, that we will do with uh, Spain, France, England, and so on. Of course, you have uh, difficulties, but uh, I think that uh, if, if you go in this direction, you can, you can just do what you do uh, with, with other countries and, and you can trigger a positive feedback because, I mean, working by peers, uh, it means facing difficulties to bring the two institutions at the same level. And, and this can give you an opportunity of real development while, uh, um, I mean, if, if you go only with, with, with the NGO approach, uh, the point is that uh, uh, you have a cycle of never ending project, three years, project, three years, project, three years. And then if the NGO does not win the project, maybe as it has to close the office and it moves away. Uh, and, and this is not a problem of the NGO. Of course, it, it is triggered by uh, by the fact that, uh, I mean, the glo global politics uh, is shifting the NGO politics to this kind of short intervention, which are linked a lot to the funding. And uh, I think that you, you cannot say that this is entirely wrong, but uh, I, I really consider that the approach of working uh, with universities at, at a peer-to-peer -peer level, it could be much, uh, much more successful in, in the long term. And, and you are basically doing the, the same thing. So for instance, now we have a project with uh, Tunisia, Egypt, and, and some uh, European countries. Uh, and, and we are doing the same thing uh, in all the countries. And, and that's an implementation project, it's not only research. So um, yeah, if you ask me this question, I, I'm sorry to be a little bit uh, um, with maybe a strong position in this, but I, I work uh, for the World Bank, I, I work for the uh, Italian Agency for Development Cooperation. They are quite larger than, than, than standard NGO, but, but I really think that the university can allow a much more long-term co commitment and relationship between institutions. And so if, if, if you... I don't know if you have additional question on this position, just let me know. Thank you, Giulio. Guido, do you have uh, any question? Yes, I was having uh, two questions. Uh, one mainly for Giulio, one mainly for uh, Mary, but uh, maybe both her comments. So, mainly for Giulio, uh, what I would ask is, uh, uh, some general consideration about uh, sediments in, in water harvesting. So in, in many situations, I think there is a lot of uh, 
issues with sediments uh, in these intense uh, uh, rainfall events uh, that are subject to water harvesting. In your experience, uh, uh, which are the main challenges, but also uh, there are opportunities in relation to water recharge, also sorry to groundwater recharge. Okay, so um, the, the issue of, of sediment, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's on different scales and, and it has different meaning to different uh, areas and water harvesting technologies. Um, for instance, uh, I mean, I, I, the, there is not a classification in this sense, but, but you can say that there are uh, some water harvesting technologies uh, which are synergistic with uh, having a certain amount of sediment and, and you have some water harvesting technologies uh, which are not. Uh, let, let's start from examples uh, where uh, sediments are not good and, and you can understand that, for instance, dams, uh, smooth dams, uh, um, they, they have a lot of, of issues uh, with, with uh, I mean, sediments. Uh, and, and this is related uh, to the, let's say, at least two points that I touch in my conclusions. So let, let, let's think about maybe the small dams implementation in a very, um, like erosion prone areas. So it's a little bit difficult to, to, to check which is the good cost benefit if you don't take into account uh, how many sediments will enter in, into your uh, uh, dams and 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 if the if the dam will be filled up and will become useful, um, then uh, you, you have to think uh, to the, the first uh, uh, slides uh, that that uh, that I show for understanding uh, when this thing can be synergistic, uh, because if you go with a blue water approach, uh, you can think that you have the blue water. So whatever comes with the blue water that is not water is bad. Okay, so I have my dam, I want to store water and it will become green water, but in, in, in that period is, is, is blue water. So if the, if the dam is filled by sediments, it's bad. But, but you have many situation and then talking about very dry areas where uh, you, you have I mean, 10 to 100 times the sediment uh, transport that, that you will have uh, in in um, situation with uh, perennial hydrology, where people have learned to deal with sediment. So for instance, the, 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 the image that I show about sand dams. So sand dams are dams in which you know, you know for sure that they will fill up uh, with sand. So the things that you do, you try to locate this dam where uh, you have a good uh, um, um, input of sediment, especially sandy sediments uh, that can fill up the dam. And, and then you take advantage by the fact that you have an, an artificial aquifer made with the dam, made with the sand that has filled the dam. And then you, you dig some holes around the dam. And, and this in very arid areas is, is convenient because basically you have a certain effect of uh, uh, removal of pollution because you have a little bit of filtration and and, and then you you prevent a part of evaporation because evaporation is very strong if, if the water is underground is better um, th there are water harvesting technologies that are also land use uh, technologies so for instance you have uh, Jasur in Tunisia where you you basically it's, it's like a sand dam, so you build the dam, you wait the dam to be filled. And since that area of Tunisia is very stony as a soil, if you have deposition in, in this uh, upstream area of the dam, you have basically a terrace where you can crop olives and, and palms. And then, for instance, in spate irrigation is even diverse. So spate irrigation is probably the, 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 the flood water harvesting technologies that has more sediment. But in that case, is, is such an amount of water that in the end, if you manage 
And if you limit a little bit the sediment input to the fields, then the rest of the, rest of the sediments, which are the, the most fine ones, uh, they are good because they are fertile. So for instance, in, in Ethiopia, we discovered this thing that people were uh, cropping using up, upstream, uphill water diversion uh, uh, channels. So the channels for entering the, the, the irrigation canals were uh, with, with uh, an upslope. So the, the, they were going uphill. And, and this was made to have the deposition of the bigger sediments in the canal. And, and save only the, the most fine sediments in the field. And then the farmers were removing the sediments only by the canal and not by the fields. So you see that, uh, I mean, that, that is another important, I agree, uh, research uh, challenge, but, but it's not straightforward. So it, it is not always a problem, the sedimentation. Thank you, very interesting. Not sure if maybe you want to comment anything in this, otherwise I have another question. Hello, was that a question to me? Can I? Hello, uh, yeah. Uh, I was uh, wondering if you would like to provide an additional comment to this question I asked to Giulio. Yeah, what was the question again? Sorry. It was about uh, issues with sediments in water harvesting. Uh, if the sediment was always, uh, let's say, a problem in water harvesting, or if there were also uh, good aspects in having sediments and dealing with sediments in all these uh, many diverse type of systems, water harvesting system. Um, yeah, thank you. If you also have, want to comment anything on that. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I, I think it's, 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 it's a big issue, uh, especially that now we are, we are doing some of the small dams and, and mostly in areas uh, which are uh, like kind of arid in, and, and receive very low rainfall. And we've seen also that uh, there are a lot of um, uh, deforestation uh, which contributes also high in terms of the sediment and uh, and reducing the volume in terms of how much water you can be able to to capture. Uh, we we are working very closely with the farmers uh, to ensure that they they practice conservation methods uh, in terms of the land use, so that to reduce the sediment in most of the um, activities which they are undertaking. Uh, We've, we've, we've just been doing this for the past like three, four years. So we may not see the results like uh, now, but we know that in the long run is something that we'll be able to, uh, uh, to support, especially uh, afforestation programs, uh, agroforestry uh, around most of these catchment areas which have been deforestated heavily. Uh, and, and we're hoping that that some of these uh, land use uh, conservation methods will be able to be uh, some of the solutions to that. But we still have a huge challenge uh, in most of the locations where we have some of these dams, especially siltation has been uh, a big challenge to us. Thank you. And I, if I can, I have a last question. Or maybe, and maybe also Julie then would like to comment. Um, in in your, uh, we had a, a slide with the, let's say the, the main goals, uh, the main let's say vision of uh, World Vision for uh, uh, improving the, uh, let's say the health condition, uh, especially of children, and uh, there was a set, a set of four uh, targets. Uh, with uh, providing safe and clean water, uh, sanitation, uh, and, and the, the fourth point, uh, and hygiene, and the fourth point was uh, ensuring that the system are maintained uh, uh, in the long term. So I was wondering uh, which do you think are the main challenges for the, the maintenance of these uh, integrated systems in the long term? 
Yeah, so uh, in terms of the education systems, I think the main issue is there around management, uh, because at the moment, our the setup uh, in terms of rural water, uh, most of the water points, including the integration systems, they are locally managed. So you have a cluster of community members, maybe a thousand or two thousand people. You do a system for them, but it has to be managed by the community themselves. So you set up committees, for example, and also you train uh, the pump mechanics or plumbers to, to be able to repair in case of breakdown. And they have to set up what we are calling the composite fee uh, correction systems, uh, meaning that household have to contribute uh, probably one or two, two euros uh, to uh, per month for operation and maintenance. So in, in some communities that has been able, it has worked well in some communities, we've seen people contributing the money for operation and maintenance. And some of them, they, they've gone even further to ensure, uh, to work with the local insurance company to ensure the main components of the recuperation system. So for example, solar panels, uh, pumps, um, tanks for any uh, breakage or, or being stolen uh, uh, on an annual on an annual basis, but in other communities, uh, it's been very difficult. For example, for them to be able to to raise um, the minimum requirements for them to be able to to run an operation and maintenance for, for for their system. So, in case of breakdown, for example, if there is a pump failure, uh, for example. Uh, so some communities cannot raise, for example, 2,000 US dollars for them to be able to buy a new pump. So meaning that they have to go back probably to government or to another NGO or to World Vision to say our pump is bent and we need, we need the pump to be replaced. Uh, while in other communities, when such happens, the insurance company is, goes there to, to do the, 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 the repairs. Uh, we're also working with the, the water utility companies whose mandate is mainly on in the urban and also the cities, and they do not extend the, that, that mandate to the rural water. So that has been a challenge. So we, we would want to do a shift from that uh, to also give them that particular mandate to be able to manage uh, the rural water systems. So we, we're going to see if that will be that challenge will be able to be. Uh, uh, addressed uh, through the water utility companies, which are well established in terms of resources, in terms of expertise uh, on operation and maintenance. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. We have in the room uh, also some students that will uh, take part this summer in September in the field activities. So please, if you have any question, it's a good moment to, to know maybe for the first time and to, to, to make some questions. Then uh, we will organize uh, in the next week uh, one more appointment with maybe, but uh, yeah, why not uh, make some question or some curiosity about the program of World Vision in Zambia, about what we could do, probably we could have uh, some uh, first uh, <laughs> First idea from maybe about the work we will do in, in September together. I know that we will uh, work uh, in the south part of Zambia. Maybe is the, the the plan? Yeah. So the plan is to work from the southern part of the of Zambia. And, um, and 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 it's one of the the dry areas, as I mentioned, uh, they receive very low landfall. And it used to be the food basket for the country because they used to produce a lot of corn, which is our step of food here. Uh, but because of the water challenges, uh, that that has been like shifting now to other parts of the countries uh, which receive uh, meaningful rainfall. Uh, and, and lead to competition in terms of uh, other uses for water. Uh, because I have to mention that uh, you will check that southern part of the country, there are a lot of water bodies, which uh, you may try to see, like we have the Kathue uh, Basin, we have the Zambezi River Basin, but very little of that water uh, is, is being used by the local communities for agricultural production. 
uh, and it's mainly used by the commercial, like the, uh, uh, the sugar companies, the hydropower station, and also for recreation, I think you've, you've seen the, uh, the, the Victoria Falls, uh, which is also in the southern part of the country. But we are still struggling in terms of how do we uh, maximize or, or utilize the available water resources in, in that particular area, uh, such that it's, it's one of the driest areas. But in terms of production, it has huge potential um, uh, uh, for that in terms of agriculture. So did you already experience the uh, conflict uh, between uh, big companies and the small farmers uh, in terms of water availability, water management? Yeah, I, I, I think in, it, it, I would say that the conflict has been there because, um, um, because it's difficult, for example, for uh, small scale farmers uh, to invest in huge pumping, for example, through the river. So meaning that um, all the riparian users, they are going to be affected. So whatever abstraction is being done by these industries and also the uh, hydropower water use, uh, it reduces how much water is available for the, for the, for the communities to, for them to be able to use. So these are some of the issues that we've been discussing um, uh, in, in, in a number of fora, the Global Water Partnership, the WaterNet, uh, for example, uh, in the region, uh, to see how do we ensure that the communities themselves also are able to access or to make use of, of, of the same water. Because the other aspect to that is also the issue of land um, uh, for them to be able to do the farming. Uh, because community members they would want to go and farm where there is water availability, especially when it comes to winter farming uh, uh, as well. Uh, so land may not be available when you see huge investment by uh, especially huge companies uh, doing all this um, uh, uh, agricultural farming and, and also hydropower uh, uh, stations. Yeah. Susanna, do you have any question? I... Not for the moment, but uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I don't know if anyone else has um, other questions. I don't know. If there is any question, I think that uh, you could stay in contact with uh, Giulio and maybe in, uh, through their contact, we will send you the presentation. The presentation we will um, put in the, in the um, platform, Massimo, isn't it? Okay, so we will uh, have all the- yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I'm really thankful to both of you for your uh, availability, for your presentation. And uh, you are, if you want, already invited for the next uh, ESIC seminar. That is uh, next, uh, excuse me, next uh, Wednesday. Yes. And it's uh, on geological risk. And so that will be the last appointment. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to invite uh, all you in the, the last event. So thank you very much, uh, Giulio Castelli, maybe Nambi, and thank you to all of you to have uh, taken part of this uh, seminar and uh, see you next Wednesday. If you thank want you to so. turn on your camera, we can uh, take a photo just before leaving. Thank you guys. <laughs> Nicola, yeah. are you taking the photo? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me mention that uh, I think I hosted Bolivia for a seminar in my course. Uh, so, so just in case there is space for some joint cooperation, since also you are engineer in engineering the department, we are agriculture, even if I am an engineer. Mm -hmm. So let, let's keep in touch. 
and maybe get updated with the map of our projects and so on. Thank, thanks again. Thanks very much, Julio. Yes. Thanks, maybe. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye. 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 bye.